hello and welcome to this joint uh, America Canadian Research Network Coalition Public Air Open Air webinar about uh, cooperative non ABC open access publishing models. Uh, so you can see we have uh, a lot of excellent speakers today. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Ariana from America and uh, she'll talk about uh, Latin American approach. Uh, then we'll have uh, Jason uh, and Tanya talking about uh, Canadian Research Knowledge Network and uh, Coalition Publica and Erudit activities in this area. And we'll also have Kevin uh, from PKP who is here for Q&A. Uh, we also have Jean-Claude Guedon, and I don't need to introduce him to you. And um, then uh, we'll have, uh, we'll talk about open air recommendations uh, towards sustainable cooperative and non-APC publishing models, which uh, covers Europe. Um, and uh, that would be me with uh, my colleagues, uh, Johan and uh, Jens for questions. Sir. And I hope you can all see Ariana's slides, sir. And uh, the way we plan this webinar, so we'll uh, we'll have short presentations, and then we'll make sure that we have enough time for discussions. And for your questions, please sir, type them uh, either in Q and A or in ch chat, and then we'll take them in the second part. Thanks a lot, and over to you, Ariana. Thank you very much, Irina. And thank you, uh, Open Air and Irina, for the organization of this event. I'm very honored to share this webinar with uh, all these experts that I really admire. Uh, well, uh, and um, give me the opportunity to um, to share our perspective from from America and from Red Alik in Latin America uh, regarding a, co a cooperative non-APC publishing model. And first, I would like to start by saying that AMELICA, for the ones that um, are not familiar with, with it, is a multi-institutional community-driven initiative supported by UNESCO and led by Redalic and Claxo. Uh, we work to provide or to preserve a cooperative, sustainable, protected, and non-commercial infrastructure uh, for open knowledge, uh, starting in the Latin American region with uh, a lot of South-South cooperation but now including uh, journals and sporting journals from uh, other countries uh, uh, once they are, uh, since they are um, uh, compliant with this, with this approach, non-commercial approach. So what is this? Uh, well, uh, this cooperative approach is an approach of science as a common and public good. Uh, Redalica and America have developed and implemented an infrastructure uh, to support uh, this academia-owned scholarly publishing for more than 1,000 scientific journals. Uh, this approach, I, uh, I have to, to say that it saves significant cost in journal production in favor of the non-profit publishing sustainability. We develop technology to uh, save uh, time and cost resources in general to, um, in, in journal production. It allows to keep journal publishing in hands of the academic. This is a very important thing for us that at the academic community uh, is, is to keep or continue being the uh, owner of the publishing. Uh, I mean, the nonprofit sector, particularly, allows native open access and open data, prevents journals from starting or adopting models like the, like the APC based one. Uh, enables bibliodiversity. I mean, I'm talking um, a little bit deeper about this uh, a little uh, after. Uh, it includes a artificial intelligence uh, aided software that automates XML contents markup and journal output files generation like EPOF, HTML5, PDF, etc. It is linked open data compliant and leverages data, uh, and I'm going to, to, show you, uh, to show you some examples about this, leverages uh, data granularity to enable novel ways of discoverability and knowledge representation. Uh, Amelica provides different services, uh, mainly for journal publishing, but as well as uh, for books, uh, for repositories. It has this project Aura to classify um, self-archive um, policies. Uh, uh, it has a, a, as well uh, one working, working group on responsible metrics aligned with uh, the Declaration of San Francisco um, vision. 
Uh, it has a, a very strong community of users and developers of the Open Journal system, as, as it is the, a key tool uh, to, um, to support this nonprofit publishing. And it provides different services in, um, let's say, different, uh, uh, different steps in the, in the process of uh, journal production. I mean, it, has, it provides free-to-use XML markup tools. It, prevent, uh, it provides uh, intelligent viewers, mobile viewers, EPUB, PDF for uh, all um, uh, articles that are published by these journals. And uh, um, talking about cooperation, we uh, implemented a model along with uh, all our uh, different universities or well, institutions in general, journals and individuals to cooperate in different ways. Uh, we share data, software, hardware, uh, and in the case uh, of Redalica and Amelica, we provide a training, we provide uh, journal quality criteria, we provide data quality assurance, we provide as well these services, including hardware preservation and full text storage and availability. Uh, and uh, we expect from journal editors that are in the universities, that are in the in different institutions, we expect that they do their own, their own uh, XML markup. So uh, this is a cooperative way in the sense that we provide the technology, we provide the training, and they, with their teams inside institutions, they uh, do the job. Uh, so um, we include journals that are uh, quality journals peer review, that follow a peer review process uh, that, are, uh, that doesn't include cost for authors. Uh, so non -APCs, only non-APC journals are included. Uh, we require this XML JATS uh, markup uh, as a mandatory requirement to be part of this initiative. And we work uh, with a lot of uh, well, uh, expert and researchers to, uh, to continue uh, thinking about uh, new ways of uh, research assessment. This is um, um, uh, our numbers, our statistics uh, from Amelica and from Redalic. Uh, we together provide services of almost uh, well, more than 1,500 journals from 20 to 23 countries, uh, including recently uh, like uh, India, from almost 700 published institutions, mainly universities, but uh, as well uh, research centers, uh, governments, public hospitals. We have uh, journals from uh, different, uh, different publishers non-profit publishers. Uh, we index uh, around well, more than a half million full text articles in our platforms. Um, and we provide um, a, this service for around 65,000 daily users that are consuming and downloading these um, articles from Redalica and Amelica. So this model um, uh, give, uh, gives, uh, provides different added value services to a journal. We expect that the journal editor follows uh, or, or focus on the quality of our journal, the, the quality of the peer review processes, and we provide different services uh, to complement the journal's capabilities. For example, we provide the quality assessment, we provide journal production tools, we provide different mechanisms for interoperability and discoverability, we provide uh, statistics on the usage of content, we provide uh, different home pages or landing pages at different levels, for example, at area, discipline, institution, or country level, so to give uh, more idea of the uh, scientific output of, uh, at different uh, granular levels. And this approach is uh, composed of six uh, elements. Uh, the first one is the, that it should be academy owned. We are very keen on uh, uh, that um, preserving all these um, uh, media of scientific or scholarly communication, scholar led and owned by academics. Uh, it is immediate open access because it is um, the natural way it, it is born. Uh, it is based on a cooperative strategy to sustain this approach. Uh, it is, uh, of course, not, not for profit and non-APC. And we really um, um, rely on technology to, to make it possible. So this is uh, our, maybe our main innovation. 
that we provide software to um, shift from a traditional article processing to a, an article processing inside a journal that is more efficient, that is based on XML. So uh, uh, many uh, manual work is avoided or is prevented. Uh, and in this case, we have some measures that we have, um, uh, we are uh, providing the service with, uh, and, and the journal saves around 90% of time and maybe uh, money invested in the uh, original or traditional article processing. So uh, based on the XML, we do the rest almost automatically. And even the XML uh, processing, we implemented different algorithms to, to make it um, uh, more or less automatic. So we are uh, providing these tools to make this process more efficient. And we recently developed um, an OJS plugin as well to upload all these output into the OJS installations. So uh, the whole process is now automated. Uh, once the, you have the peer review uh, article until it is published in OJS. So um, uh, we really believe that this is an approach that can benefit journal editors to prevent adopting models like the IPC one. This is, for example, a one um, screen when you download all your um, uh, output files uh, to the computer of the journal's editor, and then with the plugin, it is automatically uploaded into OJS. So uh, we have invested a, uh, a lot of efforts in doing this. Now around 600 journals are using this technology. And well, I think this is a very, uh, well, good, good, good results. This is, for example, a graphic that shows that this approach cuts out cost of in-design formation and uh, the time savings and cost, cost savings, all the ones that you see in color are the, um, the, the article processing, uh, oh, sorry, the, the steps in the process that are regarding to journal production that are being saved, saved with this technology. So uh, we, we think we contribute to journal editors uh, to let them focus on peer review, that this is for, for us the most important thing to guarantee quality. And we help them in, in, in these journal production processes. Uh, just to, to highlight something, this is very important because uh, this technology allows open data in a native way as well, uh, because all mathematical expressions uh, and uh, different XML elements like uh, tables and data can be marked up in XML at a very uh, granular um, level. So you, you have a, every, um, a number and every operation in, a, in a, an equation, uh, you have uh, been it is being marked individually, so it can be processed by different, for example, uh, mathematical uh, processor or statistical uh, uh, processors. So to uh, replicate uh, the research, also to find. Uh, maybe if it is well done or not. So uh, we have uh, these XMLs at this level. And this is the variety of outputs that we provide. So we believe that we can achieve organic visibility, discoverability, and impact of science well, by having uh, this every element tag and uh, can be disseminated uh, or be integrated in a, in, in a in the knowledge graph, let's say. So we believe in the potential of this model because what we, we are based in XML and RDF data files with open data. We have some examples on linked open data as well. Uh, so uh, we are uh, relying on technology for uh, participatory and inclusive scholarly communications where every single piece of information could be part of this GN graph. Uh, to compose uh, a structure that expresses the inherent knowledge and to be linked to a wider and unrestricted knowledge cloud. 
and I'm stealing some phrases, uh, some phrases from uh, quotes from Jean Claude. <laughs> uh, I'm quoting here, and these are just uh, some use cases on linked open data and semantics. We recently, for example, with all this information we uh, release, uh, we launched a knowledge base on epidemics uh, during this period of COVID-19. So if we, my point is, if we have all this um, data uh, that uh, it is uh, provided by journals at this very granular level and with this uh, quality, we can quickly run algorithms. In this case, uh, we run an ontological based algorithms to get, for example, a representation of uh, the uh, knowledge published in, epi in epidemics and pandemic. So we did that last month, we, we launched it. You can see it available in Amelika as well. We are working, for example, in another one uh, for ancestral knowledge and indigenous knowledge. Uh, uh, so we are running this, uh, this, the same methodology based on uh, semantics and ontological, it's an, an ontological approach. And we are also about to publish one of on general studies. So this is just three examples that, that what we can do uh, having this information with this quality and with this structuring. Uh, this, for example, the, the resultant knowledge representation of epidem epidemics published in, in journals indexed by Redalic. The final user or the end user can have access to every article that is published in each thematic uh, if you click on each node. And it is also available at, uh, as a uh, Spark UL uh, linked open data, data point. So this is what we can do if we uh, work in a very, uh, with, with the standards and with, and with the structuring standards and with the XML and with this uh, kind of technology. Uh, just some final thoughts. Um, well, uh, we have learned a lot in Redalica and Amelica from lessons learned from Latin America, from lessons that Latin America uh, has taught us. Uh, so we, uh, in Latin America, we have seen that it is possible to run journal publishing on a not-for-profit basis. Um, Latin America uh, uh, has been performing a very good cooperative approach where everyone gets benefit from everyone's uh, investment. A distribution of cost among many stakeholders, universities, academic institutions, governments, national science agencies, hospital funders, all of them are contributing to this cooperative ecosystem. So Redalic and America have learned uh, uh, from that. Journal publishing in the hands of the academic sector promotes more inclusive scholarly communication. We are convinced about, uh, on this. Amelica and Redalic focus their efforts on preserving this ecosystem, but to extend as well this ecosystem to other regions that um, run similar um, non-profit publishing. By leveraging technologies um, to contribute in journal sustainability to prevent the adoption of for-profit business models, and by developing software and enhancing data to contribute in contents organic visibility and discoverability in such a way, and, and I have to stress this, that impact and research assessment are dissociated from, from the uh, so-called mainstream databases. So we are working uh, to give uh, scientific content the opportunity to seek organic content because technology can or, or is bringing us this opportunity to do that. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ariana. I don't see any questions yet. Uh, just a comment from Neve Brennan uh, from Trinity from Ireland. Let's all embrace the Amelika principle and move over to the Redalic model. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Then, uh, oh, actually, there is one question. Um, uh, Yadrenka is asking, how do you define editorial quality? Uh, well, in fact, in Redalic, in Redalic and Amelica, we have um, selection criteria. Uh, I have to say that is very rigorous. We perform uh, this evaluation inside Redalic, but we as uh, well receive uh, feedback from an advisory board. 
So uh, just to guarantee that it follows a peer review, the journals give evidence from that peer review processes, and uh, around 50 uh, checking in the in the in this process. So that maybe you can share with us when it's done. And then er er Ernest uh, is asking uh, how is the course distributed between the stakeholders? Well, in fact, the costs are very embedded into an infrastructure of uh, research and different grants. I mean, uh, for example, just to put an example, one uh, professor at a university uh, takes or leads a journal inside the university. So part of the, the, their salaries of faculty are directed to sustain or to, to pay for the time that the professor is investing in running the, the journal. So uh, it is kind of in, embedded in different, uh, in different ways. It also includes, for example, many students labor inside journals so uh, uh, you have different well scholarships and different uh, payments to students to to do that job but as well from our national uh, uh, science um, uh, funders and, and different uh, governmental grants that are uh, given to research uh, and and these um, grants that are directed to research are uh, invested back in publishing. So uh, this is a very complex uh, uh, system of distribution of costs. Uh, and this is maybe uh, why uh, the APC model is more successful in, in terms of the adoption by funders, because, it's, because it is an easy concept. It, it is an easy fee to pay. But um, this kind of systems that are cooperative are in, involves a lot of public money uh, coming from governments to uh, universities, for example, and, and the universities uh, through salaries uh, and through different grants uh, for research um, uh, are providing this or are covering or supporting this journal publishing, but, but in a more, a little bit more complex uh, system. Thanks, and I see over a dozen other questions. So maybe let's uh, let let let's answer them um, in the second part. So, so let's let's finish with all the, all the presentations. So. And maybe sure. also if 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 you have time, Ariana, maybe you can type some of the answers in Q and A. <laughs> when of course. Dan, yeah. Dan and Jason will be presenting. Thanks a lot, and thank you for all your questions. We'll make sure that we'll we'll answer all of them. Um, and uh, over to you, Tanya and Jason. <clears throat> Thank you, Irina. Uh, hello, everybody. Very pleased to hear, be here with these um, colleagues and experts around us and uh, very happy uh, to hear about these initiatives. Very exciting. So I'm here with uh, Jason Friedman from the Canadian Research Knowledge Network and also with my colleague, uh, Kevin Stranach from the Public Knowledge Project. As we only have 15, 20 minutes, we split just the presentation between Jason and me, but Kevin is here to ask any questions and to add and feel free to, to step in, Kevin, if I, if I miss anything. Um, so I'm sharing my screen, I try. Is it there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So in Canada, we are in a very large country. Publishing practices differ from one discipline to another, but also uh, a lot from a country and a national context to another. Um, so our um, strategies on implementation of open access. Uh, oops, sorry, sorry, I go back. Um, very large country population of about 37 million Canadians. So there are large um, stretches of Canada which are not occupied. On this map you see here, we work together very closely in Coalition Publica with colleagues across Canada. But this means really that we are in different time zones and that we are like millions of kilometers um, 
far away. So uh, ERUD is hosted in Montreal at the University of Montreal. The Public Knowledge Project is hosted at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. And uh, we collaborate a lot with all these blue spots, which are academic libraries uh, that are also involved in scho scholarly publishing and uh, that are hosting journals and mainly use the open journal system uh, software for that. And then we are also together in this landscape with our colleagues from the Canadian Research Knowledge Network, which is CRKN, uh, which is um, the consortium which negotiates with different uh, publishers uh, agreements for access. Okay. Um, so we have a situation in Canada, I'm sorry, do you see this, um, where we, uh, we are lucky because we have access to public infrastructure. We are in the same situation here in Canada as um, Ariana highlighted. We would like to keep uh, a big part of it in, in public hands, by, uh, managed by the community. So we have our universities who decided to invest in open infrastructure and we also have funders who, um, who work with us uh, to support this infrastructure. It's not an ideal situation, of course, because as uh, Ariana highlighted also, that it's a very complicated situation uh, of funding when you are in an environment where you would be in um, non-commercial uh, tools and infrastructure, which are in a high competition with, um, with the commercial infrastructure that is there just beside this non-commercial infrastructure. So we have in Canada access to the ERD.org platform, uh, which is a platform that hosts uh, journals. And it's very similar to what Ariana was talking about in terms of Redalica. Redalic and Amelika. Uh, so I didn't focus in this presentation about all the features that we offer around it, but we focus a little bit more on how to work with the journals and how to, tr uh, how to transition these journals uh, to open access. Because on this platform, uh, which is not for profit, uh, highly public funded and so on, we still have journals that uh, work with the moving wall. Uh, it's, uh, we transition these journals more and more to full open access model, um, but there are still around 90 journals using um, the moving wall in order to generate revenues. And we have a lot of journals that are in a distributed system. And what we try to do is to harmonize actually the access to uh, high quality services to provide an environment where everybody has access, equal access to, um, to uh, infrastructure that provides them um, with, you know, persistent identifiers, XML with harmonized metadata and curated metadata to enhance uh, really visibility, impact and uh, discover discoverability as uh, in the same way as Ariana talked about it uh, just before. So this is why we, we are calling this now Coalition Publica because there was like this big country and different ways to do things in Canada. We had the, the French language journals from Quebec and the French language community of Canada on the RD platform mainly. And we had a lot of journals distributed across the country on OGS instances, where we collaborate very, very closely with the uh, academic libraries. And the situation was that we would wanted to think about a single access point uh, to this Canadian content in uh, humanities and social sciences and to contribute also uh, to have uh, uh, an archive of the national scholarly record uh, around these content and to avoid, to build something stable, like a stable environment to avoid that there is an exode, exodus of all these uh, Canadian content, which could easily uh, migrate to other systems uh, around the world. But the idea was really to have a national context where we can still continue to talk about national topics. And I invite you just to have a look at this opinion paper from Vincent Larivière. It's uh, kind of outdated now. It's from 14 or 15 already. But uh, I think it's still really the, 
the the theme that motivates what we do here in Canada. It is about uh, the fact that we would like to have our humanities and social sciences journals still to, to talk about Canadian topics, uh, to talk about the society, the Canadian society, history, uh, linguistic aspects, and so on. So um, there is this motivation also from funders to help us uh, to provide this uh, environment where we can continue to work with these journals instead of outsourcing everything to international journals. So we are in a situation where we uh, get public funding through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council from Canada. And these are the journals, individual journals that receive, uh, that are, uh, can apply for grants uh, with this council, three-year grants to support their editorial activities. It's about $22,000 per year. And we also have funders like the Canadian Foundation of Innovation that support uh, research uh, infrastructure, similar to what Ariana just talked about. Uh, research infra infrastructure, though not necessarily publishing infrastructure. So we are really in a funding situation where we uh, try to articulate that the publication is a, a structuring part of the research life cycle, which is, I must admit, not always easy because sometimes when you talk about publishing and open access, uh, you really forget about these research um, life cycle and the way how it is how it is funded and we also know about our journals that it's very small entities uh, these are really um, academics running these journals on the top of uh, other activities that they do they are working in departments uh, uh, they are sometimes the journals are sometimes supported by presses um, not always. Uh, the revenues vary from $30,000 to $80,000 uh, approximately, and some of them are we now also running just with five or 10K. And uh, it's really depending a lot on the personal investment of the researcher who is uh, the responsible editor for the journal, if at what state the journal is. Uh, and this is, in this context, a very poor fit for, for APCs. Uh, so we uh, don't, do not have any journals that use APCs. Uh, we have very less, very few requests of journals uh, that uh, ask to use APCs. Um, the journals that are mainly funded through the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council are not um, there is, there is no incentive uh, actually many to use APCs uh, and we are working very strongly with our colleagues in the Canadian libraries and with the partnership for open access model that Jason is going to talk on to avoid actually uh, the use of uh, APCs. And uh, we are in this publicly funded um, situation uh, where we also are uh, have an open access policy in Canada, but an open access policy with asks uh, journals to be compliant with a 12 month embargo or moving wall. So this is where it's kind of a market element that we have that is uh, that we are surrounded by um, with an infrastructure which is uh, very highly funded. And this is uh, something that we work a lot on and that we also struggle on and which prevents us from getting actually uh, more easily to complete open access. Although on the RED platform, we have 95% open access content, we still have 5% that is behind this moving wall. And what we are working on is really looking at how to transition this content now to a full open access model, which uh, can provide sustainability, of course, for these uh, small journals that we are talk talking about. Talking about. So uh, some years ago, when we were looking at this open access policy that Canada wanted to put in place, we said to ourselves, how are we going to, to work with this? Um, what we did is we wanted to reduce um, an old moving wall, which was 24 months uh, already to 12 months. And we decided to do this in collaboration with the Canadian libraries, academic libraries, um, and by working with the consortium uh, where they are working together, so the Canadian Research Knowledge Network. And we 
changed our former relationship, which was um, kind of a vendor relationship that we had, like a, or buyer and vendor <laughs> relationship that we had with the CRKN vendors as, as any other uh, provider or publisher at the same time as um, the American Chemical Society or Taylor and Francis. So we, we were just beside them and it was kind of not logic because of the uh, not-for-profit, non-commercial um, mission that we have. So we talked to the Canadian libraries and told we would like to change this in a partnership, this relationship, go back from a vendor relationship and go into a partner relationship in support for Canadian open access publishing. And um, this was well received actually. And uh, Jason is going to talk more in detail about this, how we did that in, in Canada, this change of relationship with this truly um, changing what we do and how we are we going to work together in the next years even more. Thanks, Tanya. Um, as Tanya was mentioning, uh, you know, I wouldn't quite equate them with Taylor and Francis or ACS, but we did have a traditionally, you know, a, a, a consortium publisher relationship where libraries um, subscribed, uh, basically, uh, we negotiated access to subscription journals. Um, the journals had a 24 month embargo and no money went to the OA journals because we were paying for access. Again, a very traditional sort of conventional subscription relationship. But uh, as Tanya mentioned, in 2014, we turned that model on its head really with a partnership model, which meant libraries would now support the whole collection. The initial partnership was for three years, 2014 and 2016. We then had a one-year extension in 2017. And now we're currently in year three of a five-year partnership agreement, which is really an exception for CRKN that demonstrates our commitment to this partnership. So um, one of the main or achievements was that the embargo got cut in half to 12 months. Um, and now most critically, open access journals, not just the subscription only ones received funds. Um, turning to CRKN's strategic plan, thank you, Tanya. Um, even though our relationship with ARD predates our current strategic plan, it embodies our three main strategic goals. And this strategic plan came in, in uh, came as a result of an extensive amount of consultation, not just with members but with stakeholders. Um, and it was approved just recently at our uh, seems recent, not. <laughs> not too long ago at our Access to Knowledge Conference in October of last year. So there are three main strategic goals, transforming scholarly communications, developing and fostering partnerships, and collaborative advocacy. Um, and this partnership model really represents, in fact, part of that transformative scholarly communications that um, we talk about. Likewise, ARD was one of our first formal partnerships, and we're looking to build and develop more. ARD is kind of serving as a model or a template for, for how we can um, transform a previous relationship to a, a partnership. And part of that partnership is working together to advocate on shared issues. So ARD and CRKM both see the importance of supporting research and dissemination in social sciences and humanities, and the importance of open access, which facilitates that. So I'll talk just briefly about what the partnership model is and what it's not. Um, so it's collaborative, we work together. Um, I assure you, we do not normally present with vendors. Uh, it's rather um, because we have a partnership that we work together. Um, and these voluntary contributions, which I think are fairly um, unique, um, when we first launched the partnership in 2014, some members who participated wanted to contribute more, and some members who couldn't afford full participation still wanted to contribute because they believed in the partnership and they believe in open access. And so we created a category of voluntary contributions for either those who kind of wanted to go above and beyond or those who couldn't make it work at the regular participation level but still wanted to contribute in a certain way. And it's really a shared responsibility. This isn't a transactional relationship. CRK and has representation on ARD and coalition public as governance structure. And we really work together and, and we think we have a sense of, of stewardship, I think it's fair to say, over um, this relationship, over this partnership. And just briefly what it's not, um, this is not a read and publish agreement as Tanya articulated, there are no APCs, there's no read fee, there's no publish fee, it's not subscribed to open, and it's not preprints. This is really um, quite unique, and these are the final versions of articles and, and the full published journals. 
So how do we measure success of um, the partnership? Um, this slide is from a research project conducted by Vincent Larivière, the aforementioned Vincent Larivière, a researcher at Université de Montréal. It was completed in 2018. 28 CRCAN members participated from across the country, all those blue dots on the, on the second slide. And it included usage data, citations, and faculty surveys to determine priority journals. Priority journals were excuse me, were defined as those journals that were in the top 20% of usage, citations, or survey results. And as you can see from this slide, ARUD had the second highest percentage. We were really pleased um, when we saw the results of this. And this shows that our partnership with ARUD supports journals that are important to researchers, um, which is really critical for us. And just some other numbers here um, to talk about the success. Consultations have increased, royalties to journals have increased, and journals continue um, to join the platform. In fact, 20 were added this year. So we're really pleased not just um, with how researchers value it, but also um, sort of that um, it's continuing to grow and expand. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll pass back to Tanya to, for some uh, concluding remarks. Yes, what we would like to add is here, you know, we only have 20 minutes, but we would have so much topics to talk about. But this, because this is really like a struggle, which is complex. It's about funding, funding of not-for-profit, um, non-commercial infrastructure. It's about transi transitioning to OA, and it's about creating an environment where our researchers in the future can publish and where it's really owned by the academy and still in the hands of um, of of our researchers so always is not enough we need open shared infrastructure and we need all these tools and we need to have access you know to expertise and uh, uh, to to provide this um, environment where where we can be competitive actually and where we can think about the needs uh, of the community and to respond to it as well so it's very complex and the way we tackle it currently is really through an, a collaborative approach uh, we really uh, think this is the only way to go through we are in this big canadian country here from coast to coast uh, with a lot of different approaches and languages. So we created kind of a governance structure around the public knowledge project and ERUD, where we would like to bring stakeholders more closely together. Uh, we have created a steering committee, an advisory committee, and an international advisory committee uh, in order to see conversation and exchange uh, and to have, you know, to, 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 to make it better actually than we do currently, uh, everybody on our own, but because just hearing um, uh, Ariana talk about all the XML work, it's, uh, it's very cost intensive and labor intensive and expertise intensive knowledge that we need to build commonly there and that we, I think uh, we need to share better amongst non-commercial uh, infrastructures in the future. So we, we try to build this uh, common platform of exchange here in Canada, but very connected to uh, other international initiatives in order to build uh, these um, yeah, expertise and nice projects that are out there and to make it stronger together, actually. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tanya and Jason. Um, I don't see any questions yet, so maybe, um, Let's uh, hand it over to Jean-Claude. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A or in the chat and we'll answer them later. And I think you have to unmute yourself, Jean-Claude. Oh, let me unmute you. Thank you very much. I've just been unmuted by Irina, which is very nice. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for the first two presentations, which are really very rich and important in their own ways first. Each one is a bit different from the other. And also in the possibilities of thinking of better links between such uh, projects, such platforms, such uh, objectives. So I have a lot to say about all of this. 
Let me, let me uh, start with something that some people may have heard about. I think it's called COVID-19. It's been mentioned by a few people recently. I don't know exactly why, but uh, let me go to a, a little article in the New Yorker that appeared last week or two weeks ago, in which people said, you know, it's quite surprising because when we had the SARS epidemic, uh, a lot of work began on the coronavirus family of viruses, but then after that, it sort of died off and people went on to other problems, despite the fact that a number of scientists had warned that this kind of event would repeat, and despite the fact, <clears throat> excuse me, despite the fact that uh, we had not seen the worst kind of epidemic yet, much worse might come, and in fact, with the present pandemic, we know now what would happen if we had something that were both extremely lethal and extremely contagious, it would be the complete panic over the planet and we're not prepared for it. Now, the question we might ask for ourselves is, why did people keep on studying SARS and the coronavirus while the epidemic was going on? And why did they go away from it afterwards? What are the forces in effect that are at work which prevent people from building it, building in a sort of coherent and continuous fashion problems which are, are, are of obvious importance, both for science, both for the theory of science, but also for society at large. And this kind of question can be repeated domain after domain, field after field, problem after problem all over the planet. The answer I'm going to give is that, and it may surprise some of you, is that this, the, the entity we call a journal has become such that it actually forces people to follow some sort of other logic than the obvious kind of curiosity-driven impulse or the need-driven uh, research that society requests of researchers. What we have instead is something that happened to journals uh, at some point in the recent history, which has, has changed its meaning, the meaning of these journals, and which has led to uh, many of the problems we are facing today. To go extremely fast, because I don't have the time to develop this here, uh, and in, in line with the theme of this particular webinar, I would characterize that big transformation of journals into the following. In the 1970s, 1980s, journals became intensely commercialized. Now you're going to say to me, this is crazy. Journals have been sold and bought for centuries. There have been subscriptions to journals for centuries. Everything was commercial right off the bat. Yes and no, yes and no. And I won't go into that today, but do know that for a very long time, <clears throat> journals were being subsidized by the dues of, of scientists belonging to societies and journals were being bartered between societies so that one society creating one journal with a few hundred copies could through bartering build a library of several hundred titles of journals for the price of just one journal. So we had there a model which was existing with some, some continuity from the late 18th century to the Second World War, more or less, with some commercial developments around it, but not many. And why were there not really a commercial development around those journals? Well, the reason was very simple. Journals were not profitable. They, they, they were uh, journals that were very specialized. Very few people could read them. And the, the, the result was that a publisher who evolved or developed some journals, did it for ulterior reasons, not to make money. He did it, that publisher or she did it, uh, generally it was a man, but let's, let's be fair. Uh, they, they did it because they were trying to keep links with the authors and creating the possibility of generating new books, which by contrast could be profitable. So you have, a, you have journals, they are bought and sold to some extent, they are bartered to some extent. There is no markets for journals. They are not thought in terms of, of markets. You have people doing things with journals that are really trying to access knowledge, trying to manage knowledge, 
try to develop and grow knowledge. It went so far as, for example, when a chemist like Mendeleev in China, in Russia, no, sorry about that. Mendeleev in Russia developed his very important work on the periodic table. It was published in Russian, uh, uh, in Russian journals. But Russian was not exactly the language of every scientist in the North Atlantic at, at the time. And the Germans realized the importance of that work. And they, without any, any question, picked up the better articles from, from Mendeleev translated them into German and, and published them. And you know what the Russians did to that? Did you think they sued the Germans? Not at all. They were delighted. Their articles were being translated at cost by the, the Germans and they were be, being dissemin, disseminated for nothing um, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in the North Atlantic area of, of the world at the time where most of what we call science was being practiced. I'm talking the 19th century right now. So what we have to, to think about is what happened after, let's say, 1970, 1980. And what happened is that journals were internationalized. Maxwell did a lot to do that. They were organized around a common currency, which was an evaluation tool that developed in the same period, which became the impact factor. And the journals were ranked. And at that point, you had all the elements to create a market. That's only then that something like a market of journals really emerged. So let's not think that markets and scientific journals are a necessity. They just happen to be the construction of a, a commercial system which developed in the 70s and 80s. All that was aided and abetted by particular um, historical circumstances, which I could quickly hypothesize about, such as the fact that you had one very important country that wanted to create control of its scientific research as much as it could all over the world. This was the United States and hence the role of English that became one of the important elements of Garfield's work in, uh, at the Institute for Scientific Information. And one was to isolate Soviet science from the rest of the world by precisely bringing the, uh, the whole thing under English. But these are side issues that I will not deal with today. I just mentioned them to show that there were other factors aiding and abetting the creation of a market in the 70s and 80s. And the, the, the whole world then has evolved with the marketing of journals increasingly with, at, in fact, this creation that Jason mentioned um, as a, an obstacle, the relationship between libraries and vendors. You know, the, the whole term of vendor is very, very amusing. I remember that when I was part of CRKN as the chair of the advisory board, uh, the, the, the director of the of the of CRKN at the time had a kind of mantra coming back, which was, maintaining good relationships with the vendors. This was the, this was the whole thing. You had to be nice to Elsevier because Elsevier might be nasty to you if you were not nice to them. So you have this kind of situation in which libraries found themselves fighting high prices of journals, which were made possible by the creation of a market and uh, doing it by creating consortia and thereby reinforcing the whole notion of journals as they were as they were being redefined in that market. But the problem with the journals being redefined in that journal is that journals now are competing and they're competing according to a scale which is really a scale of visibility of, of, of uh, prestige and uh, yeah, visibility and prestige. In effect, you have, uh, you have the journals of science beginning to organize this, uh, themselves in exactly the same way as the organization of uh, the top 10 tunes on radio and in, rec in the record industry at the same time, or the Nielsen ratings of television. Everything was being organized around visibility, prestige, authority to some extent, but <clears throat> in a way that led to what I would call the succession of intellectual bubbles, you know, in the sense of a 
economic bubble. Suddenly, everybody goes someplace because that's where the action is. That's where the fun is. That's where the, the visibility is going to appear. That's where you may have a chance to make a name for yourself. And you have signs then being driven through the, the impact of their work in those terms. That's what impact became to be understood as. You understand that now science is not a, does not have an impact because it impacts society. Society, science has an impact because it is being visible, because it is being, um, you might say, uh, uh, popular in, in a sense, you know, uh, popular in that particular crowd, of course. So when the coronavirus studies of SARS began to lose their interest because after all, the pandemic had been, had been in effect contained, why stay there? There's something more important happening perhaps in that other area of genetics or that area of bio, biochemical research and everybody pre, uh, rushed there. It, it's this kind of force that leads researchers to keep on running after the topics where they have the best chance to get the greatest possible visibility in order to acquire the very precious citations in order to be promoted to have a job and to get grants and perhaps even prizes. So you see how the whole thing in effect creates these bubbles, which are elements of, you might say, monoversity. Uh, you have no diversity. You have just successive forms of monoversities developing in every discipline, every field, according to the whims and, 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 and uh, you might say the interest of some leading labs and some leading journals. And that's how, the, that's how our science is being steered right now. And this, of course, creates a problem for science policy at national levels, and it creates uh, problems for science policy at regional levels, and it creates problems when crises emerge. I think, again, the coronavirus um, crisis right now is a wonderful, if I may say so, wonderful illustration of, of, this, uh, of the principles I'm trying to bring about. Which means that if we want to really think about the future, and that's where I think Erudi and Amelika Redalek are really helping us to think forward, uh, we have to rethink about what journals should be doing. And the answer actually is quite simple, in my opinion. In a sense, let me be for once, play the role of an arch conservative. Journals should go back to where they were in the 19th century. What do I mean by this? I mean by this that journals, rather than being commodities that claim to be international and, and that respond to market forces, let journals go back to being the reflection, the conduit, the, the vehicle of uh, the expression of existing, living, real, really living scientific research communities. Journals should reflect that. But to do that, we have to perhaps take also advantage of the fact that in the meanwhile, in the, in the 90s and even more in the new millennium, we have had digitization. And that is important because digitization has allowed something else to appear, which is playing a very, very important role. That very important thing that has happened, it took the form, first of all, of what was called at the beginning, remember Muse at its beginnings, remember Erudi, which followed the Muse model at the very beginning. Uh, it was the portal model. You just put journals on a kind of virtual electronic shelf and you, you essentially uh, let people browse through the, the, the electronic shelf. But quickly people understood that journals could also be related to each other in various ways with these new digital tools and the notion of platform emerge. And that notion of platform is still emerging. We don't have a, a stable, final, definitive vision of what a platform ultimately will be. But what it means is that the journal inside the platform is subservient to the platform, not the reverse. The platform is not a neutral sort of milieu like the water of a chemical reaction, for example. No, it is something that informs and shapes the journals. And meanwhile, the journals themselves should rethink themselves differently. Now, if inside a platform, 
you have you have uh, communities developing particular journals and that's where the 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 latin american model is so really really interesting uh, because the the journals there still reflect university or research center uh, communities then you can say for, for example well let's start with that and this is what america and ray dalek are doing but instead of speaking in terms of journals owning uh, controlling etc a set a fixed set of, 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 uh, of articles let's redefine journals as ways to aggregate together problems that interest a certain community during the life of that community should that community disappear should that journal disappear it does not matter the articles would remain on the platform and moreover because no journal would own any article those articles could be re-aggregated in the kind of knowledge cloud that Ariana described so beautifully in her presentation could be re-aggregated differently with different communities re-emerging inside the platform so the platform as you can see is going to control the destiny and the fate of the journal in the decades to come and we should think of journals within that context and not as an absolute which is you know we have a journal it has an impact factor it has a, a reputation it etc 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 a journal was not created on the eighth day of creation and it's not going to live for eternity and let's let's be sure about that the platform neither by the way but the platform may have a chance of living a bit longer than than the whole thing maybe journals should be like individuals where, while platforms should be likened to a species and we know that evolution working through population selection works at the level of a species not at the level of individuals <clears throat> that are casually as we know and unhappily perhaps are being casually sacrificed by the selection process so we we should go we should go through this notion of journals being part of a platform and being reflecting communities they don't they do not own uh, uh, articles but by existing as communities they exist also as way as ways to navigate knowledge when you go to a community you expect to get certain kinds of information about certain kinds of problems at least certain perspectives or certain theories or certain tools or certain concepts and you play with that and you move from community to community to create your own synthesis which will allow you to join perhaps yet another community so you get this sort of thing that can be managed through through a a, a, a platform there is something else to be done about that and i'm going back to jason's notion of partnership which I think is essential, absolute, absolutely essential uh, between um, the journal creation and the, um, the what do you call this, the, the, the articles management that we have nowadays. The, the, um, the communities that we have are in, of course, generally universities or research centers, national labs, uh, whatever, perhaps even in some cases, God forbid, let me make a joke of it, in private labs. I mean, after all, these people publish too uh, in, some, in some cases. And the important thing is, in this period of corona, coronavirus crisis, let's think about what libraries are nowadays. They're empty. They're working online. Do you need a library nowadays? Well, you might say if you digitize the whole library, Let's, let's repurpose the building for something else, maybe uh, do some gymnastics or something like that, whatever, whatever. So the libraries are in, a, in a, the period of their existence in which they have to really rethink what they are going to, to be doing in the future. And they really have to think about that very seriously, because in my opinion, some those who know me know that my, my significant other used to be the head of libraries at McGill. So I have a very, very intimate knowledge of what libraries are like. And uh, uh, the uh, libraries are really in a sort of existential nexus right now of their existence in history. I would say to go give a very quick answer to this existential problem, I would say, let's, 
latch on to the notion that Larkin Dempsey uh, at OCLC uh, brought about some time back, in which I find so compelling. Let's think of the library not as a place where you acquire stuff from the outside and then put it at the disposal of people inside the institution, which is what librarians generally do. They, pre they acquire, preserve, and organize. But let's say that they are the harvesters of the knowledge in their community. Who else can do it better than people who are right on the spot? And they can generate they can generate a library which uh, actually collects everything that's worthwhile in their community. They can certainly register what they have uh, uh, received. They certainly can expose what they have received. Uh, and uh, they could even, uh, uh, they could even, and they can also preserve all that, uh, that they have received. And in passing, you know, if you look at the functions of publishing, which are certification, uh, registration, certification, um, preservation, and dissemination, the libraries in this inside out situation already own three of the four functions. Now, the libraries can do the certification, and they can't even less do what comes after certification, but do it as, um, which is evaluation. But they can already do the three first functions. Certification can be done not by libraries, not by the institution where those things are harvested, but by networks of, li of, of institutions which can trust, trust each other as to their interests for quality. And then certification can be done if certification is done the way plus one does it. In other words, we're not trying to see whether it's of interest or if it's primary, uh, a primary importance, or whatever. We just want to know if it's serious science, if it's solid science. So we do this kind of basic certification thing. Then we have with this uh, this network of institutions and the libraries in their inside out position the possibility to develop at that point a a, a publishing system which is based on platforms. These platforms, of course, must intercommunicate with each other interoperable but they also must cooperate let me give a perhaps a, a difficult uh, example for ariana i really like their tool to create xml it's free to use but it's not free software and i understand i get it i understand why it is free so it's not free software there are people who might want to do very bad things to america if it were but if um, and, and and there is a notion of control but it does not prevent america for example to speak to LED, design LED as a trusted partner and say under certain conditions that we can both agree on you have full access to the code and everything else and be and you become co-developers of this of this uh, software and on and on and on you see the point that i'm using here with people here and in passing i haven't i haven't uh, tested that hypothesis with either of them before, so maybe they're going to react very violently to me, but I'll, I'll, I'll welcome the violence if it comes and I'll, I'll deal with it. Um, but I don't think this will be the case anyway. Those two ladies are very nice ladies. Uh, the, uh, the, the point is that the, not only are the inside out libraries leading to the, the question of um, networked network institutions to do the certification on top of the three other uh, publishing functions, but it leads to cooperation at the infrastructural level to create the tools that will be eventually the best tool for everybody. And I think if that thing starts developing that way, the power that led Linux to take over most of, of computing now, the, the only part of computing that's not Linux based nowadays is the desktop, which is you know the tail of the of the dog it does, and it's not going to wag the dog it's the dog that wags the tail um if if this starts developing that way you can see the the inherent power of doing something like that on a first regional continental and even eventually worldwide basis and in this regard i think there is a very important partnership that's emerging which is that is the partnership with open air why do I like 
the open air partnership well the way i see open air i cannot say open air is exactly the way i wish it were but it is pretty it's it's doing a very good job on the whole open air is a network of repositories now repositories are the right place to harvest the local production of knowledge open air already offers a network which is completely pan-European. It's tied with, uh, with um, La Referencia in Latin America, which ties another set of repositories. Those repositories are ready now to work with the big platforms like Erudi, like, like Amelik, like uh, Redalic and Claxo and so on. So you see how the thing is starting to emerge to create a very powerful alliance where libraries will find also their role as the providers of the repositories, the harvesters of knowledge, and the feeders of the information that then the platforms can uh, move to, toward. And in passing, I would say, since I believe there are some people from DOAJ attending this webinar, I would say that one important role DOAJ could start playing um, in the future is looking at how to put together a set of platforms that have the right qualities to be potential partners of each other, which at the same time would be a quick way to justify the existence of all the journals of those platforms instead of going by journal by journal. And at the same time, of course, it would put the right hierarchy between platform and journals and lead us into a world in which uh, journals would continue to exist, but would create a, a different, a different uh, uh, relationship to knowledge. Now, if you do that, remain, there remains one question I haven't dealt with, which is also going to conclude with my the relation with the relationship to the main theme of this um, of this little talk, as I was asked to to, to deliver it. I was supposed to talk about um, di uh, bibliodiversity. Well. If you start doing this kind of, of organization that I've been really just adumbrating here, quite clearly, the tension between the commercial logic of profit seeking and market share con conquering versus developing the right fields of research, the priorities of research, the importance of research for the, for the human species, essentially, that tension can disappear. And it means that we can develop at that point a system of communication of science, a system of publishing of science, which will be, which will be really in tune, in line, aligned with the, the, the work of the scientists, their interest, their curiosity, their social in engagement, their local commitments, their philosophical stance, their perspectives, and so on and so forth. We are, we are going to have a system like that only if the evaluation of research is not done through the proxy of journals. And as long as we are stuck with this impact factor ranking of journals to create a unified market, which actually no, has no other function but to advantage the use of one language and to advantage the use of some journals, which are considered to be the elite journals of the excellence-seeking uh, institutions, uh, then we 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 are going to be we have to move beyond that. We have to create a a, a different kind of system, and we and I've essentially adumbrated all of that. Um, last point: You're going to say who's going to finance all this? I think it has been said by others before. Um, we have a very strange system right now. We have a lot of research being funded by public money. But somehow, those who fund public money have sort of danced around the, the financing of the publishing part of the research, even though everybody agrees that research without publication means nothing. It's, it's like uh, uh, some... It's like a, a process that has never come to its fruition, to its conclusion. So one would say that if the funding agencies, all these sources of research were to 
bring about the cost of supporting the network of platforms, the cooperation of platforms, and the, the, the development of all the tools we need to make these platforms work together well, um, we could, we, we, we would have a, a commercial free, completely academically controlled and well organized system of scientific communication. And it would not cost all that much more than it does now. In fact, it probably would cost less because adding the cost of publication, the real cost of publication is far less than the price of the present journals in the competitive market-driven system. Don't forget we often confuse price and cost. Costs are quite often invisible. Price, prices are driven by market. What we want is costs which are costs without a market influence. I think I've said enough. I think I've, I've touched about everything I wanted to say. I will conclude with just one formula. I think journals, when they exist, should help manage the great conversation of research and science and nothing else. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jean-Claude. I'll wrap up with um, open air perspective uh, and uh, what we've been discussing uh, in Europe. And um, we published the report uh, and you can see who we are. It's a, it's a list of people in open air who worked on it uh, towards sustainable cooperative and non-APC uh, open access publishing models. Uh, and uh, it's available on Zenoda uh, since January this year. And we worked uh, over the past year with a number of uh, non-APC open access publishers in Europe uh, to come up with um, those recommendations. Uh, and I think this report and also what we've already discussed today uh, answer the questions that uh, some of you posted uh, when you registered for this webinar, what the recommendations and guidelines, uh, are there already good practices uh, convincing uh, universities that they should pay for non-APC uh, open access publishing uh, initiatives? Uh, what are the funding models and uh, how the, they work, how the costs are organized and uh, who is actually paying? Uh, and then of course, uh, all this COVID-19 related questions uh, that uh, of course create additional challenges for us, but uh, I think we're used to challenges. So, so what our report uh, already covers, of course it was pre-COVID-19, uh, so it doesn't include that part, but uh, it provides an overview of um, collaborative non-APC publishing models uh, in Europe and uh, we structured them um, in uh, five types of five sections. So some of them are library publishing programs, uh, and you can see examples of that. Uh, then uh, institutional support and third party funding, national collaborative funding and publishing, and uh, uh, Yadranka from Croatia and also Biljana from Serbia are with us today if you have more specific questions um, about that. Sir. Then of course there are international collaborative funding and publishing initiative uh, listed here and uh, another type uh, we suggested uh, collaborative publishing support services uh, for example, uh, Open Journal System Network in Germany and also Center for Digital Systems at the Freie Universität Berlin that offer technical services. Um, our report also addresses uh, questions like uh, what do we consider sustainability? Uh, what are the current issues uh, that uh, researchers, uh, new and emerging uh, open access publishing initiatives, institutions, funders, and policymakers are facing, and which suggestions we have to address those issues and challenges, uh, and uh, suggestions uh, 
were collected uh, during the workshop um, that our colleagues at Bielefeld University hosted last year. And uh, now some of the recommendations uh, which uh, have already been addressed a little bit today. So first, we believe that uh, funders should really acknowledge and endorse collaborative non-APC open access publishing, uh, not as an additional route, not as an alternative route, but uh, as equivalent road to open access. And I think we can see that shift already happening with uh, Plan S discussions around diamond open access. Um, and I uh, would like to see more discussions around that among funders. Um, and then it was al already mentioned today that uh, if we really want to be efficient and no innovative, it's really important that uh, publication system remains in the hands of scientific community and is supported by loan societies and libraries. And um, it also brings opportunities, uh, more transparency, discussions around the costs. And uh, you saw Ariana showed uh, what is a cost per article for Amalika. And uh, also, our colleagues felt uh, like uh, there is a need for trusted bodies to evaluate existing and new publishing initiatives. Uh, and uh, we already have Director of Open Access Journals uh, that uh, is doing this role. And uh, maybe there might be some others uh, uh, if you want to make sure that uh, publishing in uh, new journals uh, would be considered uh, as a valid publication route. Uh, so they might, we may need some more involvement from uh, research performing institutions and national funders who are evaluating uh, performance of researchers and research, research institutions. And Jean-Claude talked a lot about this today. Um, uh, we also believe that uh, medium and long-term funding is needed to support these initiatives. Uh, it can't be just project-based. And uh, we need trusted bodies to consider this uh, non-open access uh, journals uh, equivalent to maybe more recognized journals. Sir. And of course, opportunities sir, have already been discussed, sir, collaborations, partnerships, community ownership and go governance and um, shared infrastructure and services from uh, simple shared uh, financial marketing, legal services to collaborations on the level of platforms. Sir and uh, opportunity for leveraging free and open source software, creating innovations like Ariana showed, uh, providing joint IT technical support, uh, ensuring compatibility and interoperability with other systems, uh, and collective advocacy to policy and decision makers. Uh, and they need a space of a need for space or platform uh, to discuss current best practices, uh, ideas, expertise within collaborative non-APC publishing community. And I hope this webinar is already uh, a starting point for these discussions uh, across continents. Because like I said, we've, we've been only looking into European landscape. Uh, I'm really grateful for Ariana, Tanya, Jason, Kevin, Jean-Claude, uh, bringing a uh, Canadian perspective. Uh, and um, let's maybe brainstorm how we can do this more efficiently together. To answer Nicholas' question, yes, we'll post uh, presentations online. And um, apologies for running 
longer than we expected uh, with this webinar. If you could stay with us for maybe five more minutes uh, to answer some remaining questions and then uh, in case uh, five more minutes won't be enough, then we'll uh, try to answer those questions in writing and um, share with you. And I don't even know where to start. So let's, let's start with uh, Q&A questions. Uh, so quick question to Erudi. Can uh, a journal which is in, the, in a directory of open access journals be included in Erudi, which is the process? Yes, thank you, uh, Irina. Of course, it's an open platform. Uh, we have quality criteria. We apply actually the same criteria as the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council um, of Canada for this grant program. So it needs to be peer reviewed and active publication. And we look at the editorial board and so on. Um, but it's, a, it's more a question of what is this journal that you are talking about looking for? Is it about uh, full text hosting? Are you looking for an indexation and an additional discoverability point? So it's kind of, it depends on what uh, is the aim uh, of this. Uh, of this journal, what is it seeking for? Well, from our side, actually, we seek to bring more French language and uh, small journals into DOAJ currently. We're working together with DOAJ on that. Um, so this is like reciproc ways that we need to create and enhance. But I would be happy to discuss if you have my uh, email, just email me and we can talk about it. Of course. Thanks. Then there is a comment from Garrett. Uh, the trajectory of EU open access policy appears to be tilting towards a transitional re APC model as the only game in town. Do the panel think that this prioritizes the need of traditional big publishing over those of the global research community? I don't know if someone wants to take this one. I can try to answer very quickly. Actually, it's um, uh, what we were talking about. We need to advocate better, actually. We need to come together and advocate for uh, this not-for-profit uh, infrastructure that's, that work uh, non with non-APC models. I think there we are missing a, a common voice currently. We have talked uh, about this on our International Advisory Committee together with the colleagues from Open Edition and OPERAS. Uh, in Europe and uh, with Amelika, Dominique Mabini. Uh, so we were thinking and looking at ways to create a more uh, louder common voice of our of the impact of this, of the possible impact for, for this. And I think one question is, is because, you know, when you are in these uh, specific platforms uh, or more local uh, systems it's also all, uh, often a linguistic uh, context that is behind that and um, you know the English language is still the lingua franca which is really very strong index the impact factor and so on so uh, the, it's a complex question which has no easy answer but I think what we really need to do as uh, as groups is what we do here to uh, advocate for a more common voice towards um, a change of the system and to, uh, to make, to, to sensibilize actually the funders uh, on these issues as well, and not only on the big issues of other big publishers. Thanks a lot. Then there is a comment from Yadranka. Um, we offered some hope. Uh, there is a question from Robert. How can you explain community-owned platforms are not taking off more rapidly and widely? And then maybe a little bit related comment from Rema. What do you think about uh, European Commission selection of F1000 as publishing platform of EU-funded research? Would have not been better to use any other existing cooperative public platform? Do you think could be an alternative to Plan S? Do you think Plan S is innovative model, just a model to keep the status quo? And then um, a comment from Wendy. 
that's regarding a need for community of for non-commercial journals to share experience and exchange information. We have recently funded uh, the Free Journal Network. We also manage a forum on GitLab. If anyone is interested to join us, feel free to email and then send this email. And that could be one of the voices. Uh, Anyone wants to answer any of that? Uh, uh, Irina, I think Jean Claude uh, wants to, to say, some, say something. But I think you're muted, Jean Claude. Oh, let me. Speak or? Yeah, no, no, now, now you can speak. Okay, thank you. I wanted to, to address this notion of the relationship of platforms to communities. Obviously, a platform is several communities and that makes it a bit more difficult for communities to take hold of platforms. There is a governance problem that has to be solved there and models of, of governance would be really very welcome. With regard to Plan S, there is I think a negative and a positive uh, side to it. Uh, Plan S, as Dominique has pointed out over and over again, has been designed in a Europeocentric uh, vision which at first and even now has not paid enough attention to the rest of the world. But there is one and it is completely journal centered and it's completely uh, biased in favor of APC models, which is uh, obviously maintenance of a certain status quo which favors the big commercial publishers. But there is one silver lining in Plan S in my opinion. It's that it allows for the first time a, a forum for a bunch of funders to really get together and discuss what do we do as funders with regard to research rather than just how do we fund our national or our thematic um, uh, area of activity. And I think it's starting to give some minor, small, slow, yet I think interesting developments. The fact, for example, that finally at Plan S, they managed to include possibility of integrating funders that would want to support platforms such as Redalic rather than simply uh, support the payment of APCs, I think was a, an interesting step forward. And we, what we have to do with Plan S, especially with Johan Rorick, who is the, the, the so-called champion, is to keep on working on him to push them to say, look, your system right now is not coherent. Your system right now is just maintaining, maintaining the, the, pre, the, pre, the present commercial system with a different business model. That's all you're, you're doing. Uh, we want something better and, and deeper than that. And I think you can do better than that. And I think we, we, we should work in that direction. To go back to the notion of platforms, I think it's time to really look at what platforms exist also, uh, for example, in Indonesia, in India, in, in China, in order to start really widening the, 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 the budding, the emerging network of platforms working together. And there again, some sort of world forum of, and the go governance system should be uh, invoked there. And the model there, it seems to me, is the internet. You need inside this platform some things like the equivalent of the IETF in order to get the right kinds of standards, the right kind of protocols, and the right kinds of forums also to discuss all that on the world scale. If, if the, this movement is, allow, is capable of doing that, it will move forward very, very well. Irina, I just want to uh, briefly add that uh, exactly, as Jean-Claude said, uh, funders have the, uh, a great responsibility in directing uh, uh, institutional uh, decisions to the right way. And this is why in, in Latin America, we are uh, concerned about the uh, incursion of Plan S in our system because uh, it, uh, Plan S has to be, or has to, to bring a broader vision when, it, uh, when he entered to regions like Latin America, because our governments and our different stakeholders, they are already supporting this. So we have witnessed uh, um, our system is degrading 
because he is, uh, our system is adapting uh, different another business models coming from the commercial uh, sector. So we have uh, seen in Latin America a very worrying um, landscape of um, uh, of shifting from non uh, publishing non-profit publishing models to the commercial ones so uh, we have to be very careful in how we are going to cooperate uh, in this uh, well among regions and among uh, different stakeholders globally and yes i totally agree with tanja we 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 need to unify our voices we we have to work together more closely uh, to to speak up on on the importance of of preserving and reinforcing what we uh, in Latin America, what the journal editors are doing uh, well, instead of degrading the system. Okay. So we have to be very careful in the future. I agree. I pretty agree. <laughs> Thanks a lot, sir. And through Bianca's comment, uh, should all non-APC publishing models be collaborative? And I think yes. <laughs> And the question from Dmitry, uh, how to ensure nonprofit publishers is not, not becoming profit and getting acquired. And I think you can ensure that by uh, the legal status, sir. So it, there is a way to register uh -huh. in a way not to be bought and sold and also community governance. And Jean-Claude, please. Yeah, I would, I would like to, uh, what you say is correct, but these are the tools to prevent yourself from being, being acquired. But when you do, when you follow certain ways of developing your platform, you open yourself up to being essentially co-opted, if not bought out and so on. I think the recent evolution of Cielo, uh, for example, including Abel Packers working on, um, uh, working with um, the people from the Open Science um, Business Institute or whatever it's called, um, is, is very worrisome because in effect, by having pushed as hard as he has, the notion of impact factors for his own journals is opened up the whole the whole set of journals to being preyed upon by the commercial system. He, he seems to have said, "I can use the currency without being bought up," and of course, uh, he's going to have a hell of a fight on his hands if he tries to hold back with this kind of, of strategy. So, legal ma legal means are very important, but they're not sufficient. Thanks a lot. Um, again, apologies for going over time with this webinar, but I think these are important and timely conversations and uh, I hope we'll continue them uh, in, uh, in a bigger group with participants from Asia and Africa as well. Uh, so thanks Emilia uh, for joining us today uh, and um, thank you to all presenters and thank you to all attending and uh, sending your questions. I hope we addressed all of them. Um, uh, I'll send a link to slides and recording and I'll, I'll also send out uh, Q&A. Uh, thanks a lot, Ariana, for typing all the answers. Uh, thanks again. Have a nice uh, day, evening. Have a good week and uh, stay well and safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.